I'm going to invite you to turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We will be in the last half of that chapter, starting at verse uh, 17. Uh, You probably didn't notice, but I haven't been here for a couple of weeks. Uh, Two Sundays ago, I was away because I traveled down to the Lower Mainland for a memorial service for a friend and mentor uh, of mine, uh, another pastor who passed away after a long battle with cancer. Many many of you wouldn't know him, but um, in the circles that we were in together, he was quite well known, and there was about 800 to 1,000 people at that memorial, and it was sort of like a reunion, uh, seeing a lot of uh, old faces and um, just reconnecting with people, so there was, there's always that positive side to attending something like that, so I was away for that, and then last Sunday, um, I was, as, as Kevin is today in Chase, I was in Chase last Sunday, uh, sharing the word with them there. They've joined in with this series in Ephesians, they're a few weeks behind us, and um, it was great to be there with them. Uh, so I'm here today, obviously, as you can see. Uh, next, next Sunday, uh, we will continue on in our uh, series in Ephesians, but we will have a guest speaker um, because next weekend, uh, a team from Fellowship Pacific, which is our family of churches, uh, will join us. They'll do some uh, training, some leadership training with our board and others in leadership on Saturday, and then they're going to stay over, and Mike Mahorder, who's one of the fellowship staff, uh, one of my mentors, um, will preach here uh, in the next section on Ephesians. So we're looking forward to that. Make sure you plan to join us next Sunday. And then, yeah, then shortly Easter and before long, Christmas, it's just around, <laughs> it's just around the corner, I'm telling you, you blink and it's there. Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 17. Now I say this and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger, and clamor, and slander, let it be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. This is the word of the Lord. Back in uh, 2016, it was reported that uh, six years after dramatic weight loss on the TV show, The Biggest Loser, remember that show? It's kind of a fun one, right? And I think they brought it back. I, we used to watch that show. There's, there's something attractive, there's something fascinating about people, you know, changing their lives in such a profound and dramatic way, and we, we kind of got hooked on it. But um, six years after dramatic weight loss on that TV show, most contestants in a recent study, had regained the pounds. 
Researchers studied 14 contestants who had gained back, on average, 90 pounds each. Only one participant hadn't regained any weight. Now, hearing that, it sort of begs the question, of course, why? Why? Why would that happen? How? how? What, what caused this um, backtracking? What caused these people who had seen such dramatic change? What, why? What, what led to this? How did this happen? Well, that's a very, um, I think there's a very complex answer to that. I'm not here to speculate on, uh, you know, the psychology or the physiology of weight loss and weight gain and all that sort of stuff. That's not the point here. But I think part of the answer to that why question, why did that happen, part of it at least for most people, is that we tend to revert. We tend to go backwards. We tend to be drawn back, be pulled back into old ways, into old patterns, into old habits, into old uh, um, identities. You know, life really is, whether you're talking about uh, weight loss or uh, in our case, you know, as a church, we talk about spiritual formation. We are being formed as, as spiritual people. And so in whatever context you're talking about, life does tend to be two steps forward and one or two or three or four backwards. There, there just seems to be something that pulls us back. We all tend to fall back into these old identities, these old patterns of thinking, these old ways of living and believing and behaving. But I, what I want us to, to grab onto this morning, this big idea, and, and this is just one of several. You know, I, I, I said it in the first service, I say it over and over again, these passages out of Ephesians are so long and packed full that, you know, if you don't like my big idea, if you don't like my outline and my sermon, write your own because there's 26 other sermons that could be drawn out of this, okay? But my big idea for this morning out of this passage is that in Christ, the church is a new people with a new orientation, living a new way of life. To see those three things there, a new people New orientation, new way of life. And so the first one, this idea of a new people, where is that in here? Where do we, where do we see that? Well, we see it, um, it's stated kind of um, negatively, but it's right there in verse 17. He says, now I say this and testify, I affirm in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. This word Gentiles is an interesting one because it's not something we use often uh, here in 2024. And so what's meant by that is essentially the people who are outside of God's covenant, people who are outside of God's promise. And so taken in context, you know, you think back 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago, you would have had the people of God, the the Jewish people, the, the ones chosen by God, those who are in the, the nation of God, as it were, and then you would have basically everybody else, the nations, the, the, the crowd, as it says in the message. And so he says, you must no longer walk as the nations, as everybody else, as those who are outside of God's covenant promises. Basically, he says, stop identifying as those who don't belong to God, because you do belong to God. Church, in in Ephesians, church here in Salmon Arm, you belong to God. So stop identifying as those who don't belong to God. You are a new people. You're a new people. And the Apostle Peter says something very similar over in uh, his first letter, 1 Peter 2, and right around verse 9 and 10, he says, you were, you were not a people, now you're a people. You had not received, received mercy, now you've received mercy. You are a new people. And then Paul goes on to, um, to describe this, this um, old life, this, this walking as the Gentiles, as it were. And he, he does so in such a way that it, he, he starts with the inner life and then describes the outer life. And that's kind of how we live, isn't it? We live from the inside out. What we do on the outside stems from a place that's, that's in our hearts, in our minds, in our inner beings, in our inner self. And so he starts with this description of walking as the Gentiles do, the, the, the opposite of being a new people, okay? 
He starts with the inner life in verse 17, 18. And he says such things as, as walking in the futility of their minds, darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God, alienated from, from true spiritual life because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts. Now, when you think about that description, you think about you know, the futility, the emptiness of their thinking, the, the darkness of their understanding, all these things. Is Paul just simply talking about those who are experiencing brain fog? You know, those who are figuratively, figuratively it's a hard word to say, uh, brain dead? You know, is he talking about people who are just not very smart? Is that, is that what he's talking about? Is he talking about mere intellectualism? I, I, don't, I don't think so, because, you know, when you think about um, the brilliant Greek philosophers uh, that shortly preceded Paul and formed the context under which he's writing, right? When you think back historically, you had people before Paul, such as Socrates, you had Plato, you had Aristotle, you had... Um, Hippocrates, you know, and if you go into the field of mathematics, you'd have Archimedes. I mean, Paul himself had um, direct interaction with this uh, philosophic intellectualism that was alive and well in his day. If you go to Acts 17, it talks about direct uh, conversation he had with uh, the Epicureans and the Stoics. So, so intellectualism, alive and well, in the world outside of Christ. So is, he, is that what he's referring to? Well, I don't think so. I think there's more to it than that. I think what Paul is describing are, are those who do not have the light of Christ shining in their hearts and their minds, illuminating, um, illuminating his message to them. So it's not just about intellectualism. We're talking about highly spiritual things. This, this inner life that is darkened and futile and alienated, separated, excluded, ignorance and hardness, this stone-like quality to this inner life. And then he goes on with this description and it flows, this, this inner life then flows out into the outer life. Verse 19, look at this. He says, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. This phrase, given themselves up, is an interesting one. It's another way of saying it is that they've betrayed themselves. They've given themselves over. And when you, th- when you hear that word betray, you can think of what, uh, what Judas did to Jesus. You know, there's, there's Jesus and his followers at the, uh, the Last Supper, their last Passover meal together. And Jesus accurately, correctly predicts in that moment, quite, quite jarringly, really, you know, they're just try, trying to have supper together. And he's like, one of you will betray me. One of you will give me up. One of you will give me over to what's evil. You're going you're gonna to give up the perfect, righteous son of God. What you know to be right, you will betray that. And that's essentially what's being said here. Walking as the Gentiles do means giving yourselves over, betraying yourself, betraying your own conscience to sensuality, greedy to practice or indulge in every kind of impurity, which is often uh, displayed as sexual immorality, impurity, filthiness. And so to illustrate kind of what's being talked about here, just imagine then a a person who really has kind of an, an empty, insubstantial way of thinking and believing. There's a darkness over their mind that prevents clarity. Their perspective on life is pretty much non-existent or at best incomplete and clouded. This is a person who is cut off from really living life to the full, living with richness and abundance, living with completeness, living with hope and joy. A person in this state might, might say things like, you know, I just feel like something's missing. They might say, I just feel so empty on the inside. They might say, you know what, I just, I just don't get it. I don't get life. What's the point? Can you relate to that? Have you ever said those things? But perhaps over time, more and more, as this person becomes numbed to the difference between right and wrong and, and step by step, little by little, betrays themselves, giving them over to these sensualities, these impurities, they begin to make 
poor decisions little by little, engaging in, in behavior that is questionable at best and downright evil at worst. This is a, this is a downward spiral that leads to nothing but rock bottom. Now, it's easy for us, especially if you haven't lived a, a very hard life, it's easy for us to kind of categorize and label and sort of make all kinds of assumptions and say, well, you know, what he's really talking about here is, is drug addicts. He's talking about alcoholics. He's talking about convicted sex offenders. Those are the really bad people. You know, that's, that's what walking as the Gentiles really means. But no, no. This is every one of us, fellow sinner. This is you. This is me. This is my story. This is your story. We, apart from Christ, we walk as the Gentiles do, dark and futile, separated, alienated. This is each one of us. How do we know this? Two reasons. First of all, because the Bible says so. Romans 3, for all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. Earlier in that same chapter, uh, Paul is quoting... um, Psalm 14 and Ecclesiastes 7, and he's saying, there is no one righteous, no one understands, no one seeks after God, there's nobody. We're all in the same boat, we're all together in this. We all have the same experience, we're all drawn back, we're all pulled into this old way of thinking, these old habits, these old identities. So that's the first reason that we know it is because the Bible says so. Second is by experience. You know, if, if you're honest and you honestly reflect on your life, um, we all experience this, don't we? I mean, I think about my own life and how, um, you know, as, as a branch connected to the vine, right? John 15, Jesus said, uh, I'm the vine, you're the branches, remain in me, right? And, and if I <laughs> fail to remain, if, if that connection, if me as a branch that connection to the vine <clears throat> is even just strained a little bit, very quickly, very easily, does my faith turn into fear and poor decisions start happening. And I just start going down that, that path and I can, see, I can see where that leads. But you're a new people. You must no longer walk in that way. You must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. You're a new people. You are a new creation. And Paul jolts us out of this description of the old way, of, of walking as the Gentiles do with verse 20. And he says, but that is not the way. And you could pretty much leave that sentence there. But he helpfully adds, the way you learned Christ. That is not the way you learned Christ. You have a new orientation or in other words, do this instead. You know, the first, the first point you'll see on the screen there was a new people or stop it. Because, you know, I don't mean to brag or anything, but I did go to the Bob Newhart School of Counseling. <laughs> and if you don't know what that is, you can go to YouTube. You can search Bob Newhart, stop it, and you'll receive an education in counseling just much as I did. So stop it. You're new people. You have a new orientation, so do this instead. Since, verse 21, since the place to find truth is in Jesus, right? I'm assu- Paul's saying, I'm assuming that's the foundation. I'm assuming you have the information. I'm, ass- I'm assuming you've been taught and you understand the gospel, at least on a very basic foundational level. And so since that's true, since Jesus is true and, that's, and the gospel is true and this is the place to find truth, then, therefore, it is Out with the old and in with the new. Out with the old. Verse 22. He says, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Put off your old self. Take off the old humanness. The word there is anthropos. Uh, Maybe you've heard of anthropology, which is the study of humanity, the study of humankind. And so he's saying, take off the old humanness. Take off the old human nature. Take off the ways that, that pull you backwards. Take off the old anthropos, that way of walking as the Gentiles do, those ways that are tainted, distorted, corrupted, and deformed by sin. 
Basically, everything we just looked at in the first point, verses 17 to 19, all those things, take all of that off, out with the old, and then in with the new. And he says two things about bringing in the new. Verse 23 and 24. First thing he says there is, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. In other words, be recreated in the, in the spirit, in the pneuma, in the inner invisible ways of thinking and believing, as opposed to walking in the futility of your mind. Paul says a very similar thing over in Romans chapter 12, and verse 2. Do you know that verse? He says, do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. Right? Take off the old identity. Put that aside. Instead, be, be what? Transformed by the renewal of your mind. That was one of the first verses uh, that we were, uh, that we had to memorize in, in Bible college uh, way back in the day in our spiritual formations class. And at the time, you know, as a 19-year-old, no offense to 19-year-olds, but when I look back, I didn't get it. You know, I was like, okay, well, that's, it's a thing to do. Teacher wants us to memorize this, so we're going to memorize this first. That's great, you know. But I'm so glad we did. And I think, you know, 25, 26, 27 years, <laughs> some years later, I think I'm beginning to understand the importance of that verse. Be renewed. That's the inner part, right? Remember, remember the inner part of, the, of walking as Gentiles is inside out. Now again, we have that same pattern, inside out. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. In verse 24, put on the new self. Put on the new self, the new anthropos. Put on, the, the image there is of, you know, getting dressed, clothing oneself, dressing oneself, which is the absolute opposite of putting off that we just saw in verse 22. Put on this new or this previously unknown self, this this new anthropos that is created after the likeness of God. We're told in Genesis chapter 1 that when God made people, when he made humanity, it says that he made them male and female, and he made them in his own image, after his own likeness. And every human being carries that, what we call a mago dei, that, that image of God. Every human being is made in that way. Now, what happens, of course, is sin takes over, and sin destroys and taints and distorts and deforms everything. And so what Paul is saying is that take off that bad stuff and put on that image of God that, that, that you're created in anyways. Put on that which is right and in alignment with God's character and his ways. As I said, sin, because of sin, nothing is the way it's supposed to be. We know that. Just take a look around. Just think about your own life. But because of the gospel, the good news, we are invited, and not only invited, but we are empowered by God's Holy Spirit to join God in the work that he's already doing of restoring ourselves and the whole of creation to how it's all supposed to be. This is restoration. Now, the easiest way to illustrate this, of course, is just to think of <clears throat> somebody who is wearing dirty, torn, damaged, ill-fitting clothes. You know, somebody who just looks a wreck. They're filthy, and, it, and it's ripped up, and, and it doesn't fit. It's too small, or it's too big. And imagine then that person removing that, putting off, taking off that, that, that dirty, damaged, ill-fitting clothing, and then hopefully maybe taking a shower first, and then... Don't picture that part. <clears throat> Give them some privacy. Come on now. But then putting on clean, whole, pristine, properly fitting clothing. That's the, that's the image here. That's the, that's the picture we get in our minds when he says, take off and put on the new. Out with the old, in with the new. Now, is this just about behavior modification? Is this just about trying harder, doing better, you know, creating a, a, a checklist. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a better person today. Well, not really, not entirely, okay? 
Because as I've been saying, this works from the inside out. It doesn't work from the outside in. We don't start with the outside. We start with the inside. We start with the inner transformation. Now, will your behavior be modified in the process as you're... Tra- yeah, absolutely. It should be. If it's not, there's probably a problem. As you allow the gospel to seep into your heart, your actions should absolutely follow. How you live your life should absolutely follow. And what Paul does next, the next section, my next point is he gives us several examples. He gives us several points of application to, to living out this new life, this as a new people who have a new orientation. He basically says, now, now here's how, right? It was stop it, do this instead, and here's how. He basically says, in summary, watch your mouth <laughs> and your heart and your mind and your hands, all of, all of you, your whole self, your whole being, everything on the inside and, and outward as well. You have a new way of life. And he gives us five, at least five. As I said, if there's more, or if you break things down differently, please do so. But these are the five that I see for now. The first one is right away in verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, Falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Speak the truth, he says. Now, we saw this earlier in chapter 4, verse 15, you know, it talks about speaking the truth in love. What that is not, is that is not about being brutally honest with somebody about how you really feel about them, okay? That is not what that is. What it is is it's about using your words to be a conveyor of the gospel to one another out of a deep sense of care and compassion. It's interesting that he uses the word neighbor there. It reminds me of a, of a parable Jesus told. A parable is a story with a point. And uh, Jesus tells us one parable where he says there, there's a man, a, a, a Jewish man, who's traveling and he's hijacked on, along the way on the road, and he's, he's beaten up, and he's robbed, and he's, he's left injured and with nothing. And several people pass him by, and, and they're the kind of people that you would think would help him, but they don't. And eventually, another man comes along who's a Samaritan. Now, a Samaritan would have been religiously, culturally, diametrically opposed to everything that that Jewish man would stand for. Yet it's the Samaritan who helps him. And Jesus says at the end of the parable, now who was that man's neighbor? Well, the one who looked after him, the one who cared for him, the one who had compassion on him, the Samaritan, that's who his neighbor is. Speak the truth with your neighbor. Not, Not to vent, but to express care and compassion for your neighbor. What that could look like, perhaps, is loving someone enough to gently, graciously, appropriately point out someone's blind spot, a brother or sister's blind spot, a blind spot that is perhaps contrary to the gospel and is potentially harmful. That's an example. That's not all it is, but that's an example of speaking the truth to one another, to our neighbors out of care and compassion. That's the first one. Then he goes on, number two, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Now, sometimes people want to take this as, as license, you know, or perhaps even instruction. Like, why are you so angry? Because the Bible says so. Be angry, it says, and they, they sort of stop there, right? The Bible tells me to, so I'm going to be angry every day, all day, for the rest of my life. No, no, not really. That's not really what's being said here. And, and, and actually, he, he touches on anger again later in verse 31, and we'll get to that. But for now, let me just say that he says, be angry, do not sin, do not let the sun go down in your anger. In other words, don't stay angry, and don't give, in doing so, don't give any opportunity to the devil. Don't give any time or space to your enemy. You know, you hear this in sports a lot, whether it be basketball or in hockey, when you're playing defense, you're told to take the time and space away from your opponent. Don't give that 
the guy with the puck or with the ball, don't give him any time to, to make a good pass or to, to make a move. Don't give him any space to, to make a move on you and, and fake you out and get by you. Take away his time and space. And the same thing is being said here of the devil. Take away the time and space of the devil. Because if you're, if you're angry and sinning in your anger and staying angry on and on, what you're actually doing is you're giving time and space to the devil. That seems like a bad idea to me. I don't think we should do that. I think we should heed the, the warning and the instruction here to be angry. That's not instruction. It's more concession than anything. But do not sin and do not stay angry. Number three, this is a very simple one. Verse 28 uh, where are we? Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands that he may have something to share with anyone in need. In other words, let the takers become givers. Simple as that. Number four, we'll expand this one a little more. This is verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. We'll break that down a little bit. First of all, that word corrupting. A few synonyms. Bad, rotten, harmful, unwholesome, evil, foul, offensive. Is that enough synonyms for you? Let none of that kind of talk come out of your mouth, but only such as good for what? For building up. I, I've heard John Piper say it somewhere, and I couldn't find the reference, but I know he said it, and so I Give him credit for this, but he, he says this idea, this concept of building up with your words requires coming in underneath. And so there's this aspect of humility to it. Because it's, again, like, you know, this idea of speaking the truth is, is not about um, telling someone what you really think about them. It's not about being above and talking down, but it's about being beneath and building up with your words in humility, building up as fits the occasion, or as the NASB says, according to the need of the moment. I like that, according to the need of the moment. Because you see, not everything needs to be said all the time. That's one of our biggest problems. You know, and James talks about this, right? The tongue, the power of the tongue. That's one of our biggest issues as, as people. Sometimes we just talk too much. There's, you know, others who have a bigger problem with that than others. There's some people I've met, certain individuals, where I just want to say to them, I want to just speak the truth and say, you know what, you talk too much. Just stop. Please stop. <laughs> I never say that, of course. Never. Not everything needs to be said all the time. Sometimes it's better not to speak at all. We need to be sensitive to the moment we need to be attuned to the listener and their need. We need to be attuned to the context and the situation. We need to exercise a high level of emotional intelligence when it comes to using words. That's what as fits the occasion means, that it may give grace. Or as the message says, say only what helps, each word a gift. Grace, gracious words are such a gift to each other. And so, let me ask, do your words add, do my words add to the spiritual health and well-being of, of, your, of your listeners? Or do they subtract? Do they detract? Do they take away? Do they steal? In other words, are you a giver or are you a taker with your words? And then Paul interjects this, you know, we've, we've covered four of these practical things. And then he interjects verse 30, just to, I think just to make sure we're still on track, just to make sure we understand why we're talking about these practical things. He says in verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. In other words, he's saying, as you who are marked as belonging to God, you who are a new people, you who have a new identity and a new orientation, as such, behave in such ways that are in alignment with who you are, who you belong to, because to do otherwise breaks the heart of God. And then he moves on to the fifth and final point of application. Verse 31 and 32, let all bitterness and wrath and anger, notice that one, 
Back in 26, he says, be angry and do not sin. Don't stay angry. Here he says, just put it away. Just put it away altogether. And anger and clamor, all the noise and all slander, all the, all the malicious talk. Let it be put away from you along with all malice. It's kind of a summarizing statement. All these things, all malice, all the, all the bad stuff. Let it be put away, he says. Put it away. That's an interesting word because um, it's, it's the same word uh, in the original that was used by the crowd who demanded that Jesus be taken away and that they be given Barabbas instead. I don't know if you know that story. Uh, the, the crowd is there, and, and Jesus is, has been arrested. He's on, essentially on trial, and, um, and the crowd's given a choice. You know, do you, do you want to release this man, this, this Jesus of Nazareth, or do you want us to release this Barabbas? And the crowd says, you know, give us Barabbas. Put him away, referring to Jesus. Put him away. Take him away. Get rid of him. Put him, put him off. Execute him. Crucify him, they would say later on. It's the same word here. And so when Paul says, put all of these things away, this bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander, all mouths, when he's saying put it away, essentially what he's saying is execute it, crucify it, mortify these things, put them away. And instead, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving. You know, we pray in the Lord's Prayer, Forgive us our sins or our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass or sin against us. I love how soft this image is, right? When you read those words, be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving, because you've been forgiven. This is a stark contrast to what we saw earlier, isn't it? Darkened in their understanding, alienated, alienated. Due to the hardness of heart, they've become callous. See the contrast there? Hardness and calloused. And now here we have this soft, tender-hearted, forgiving image. Now, of course, the greatest example of, of this new life, how to, how to live it, how to orient yourself in this way, is, is Jesus Christ, of course. He's always the greatest example. <laughs> He's always the greatest demonstration. He demonstrates perfectly what this new life means and what it looks like. And I think specifically of his trial and his execution. During his trial, we're told in Matthew 27 that he gave no answer, not even to a single charge. As he's being falsely accused, as he's being maligned, as he's being, um, he's, 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 he's subject to slander and malicious talk and the clamor and all the bitterness and all the wrath of the crowd and his, his judges he gave no answer, not even to a single charge. And then fast forward to Christ on the cross, and we have only seven recorded uh, sayings while he was on the cross, including Luke 23, 40, 34, where he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 